Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Darkest Hour. I'm your host, Amanda Jane. Did you ever have an imaginary friend growing up? I know I did. Deep down, I knew I couldn't see Jeannie. She wasn't real. I would get mad at my brother for sitting on her. But I knew, at the end of the day, I had ultimately made her up. She was part of my imagination. But what happens when your imaginary friend isn't so imaginary? Instead, they are real by one way or another. Real and deceptive. Because they aren't actually your friend at all. No, it's much darker than that. At least it was for one of our listeners. And we'll hear their story, and more, tonight, on The Darkest Hour. So, let's get started, shall we? For the past year or so... I've been noticing that things around me don't seem normal anymore. I continue to have this overwhelming sense that everything is fake, in a way, or almost dreamlike. I've even kicked around the idea that I may have died already, and I'm in some sort of state of purgatory. I recently took my family on a weekend getaway to Seattle. Being a couple hundred miles away from our home in Celia, Washington, It's an easy trip for my wife and I to manage with our two kids, 11-year-old and 4-month-old. Over the course of our weekend excursion, I experienced a few things that I found to be odd and left me feeling a bit uneasy. The first occurrence was trivial enough, but it sort of set the tone for the eeriness of the weekend. I was gazing out the window of our hotel room on the 12th floor, sipping a cup of coffee, when I noticed a plastic bag drifting in the wind. I watched the bag dance around in the air as it slowly descended. A green dumpster, 12 stories below, caught my eye, and I immediately thought, what if that bag floated all the way down there and landed in that dumpster? I stood at the window for five minutes or so, watching the bag slowly float towards the ground. Gliding left, right, back and forth. The more I watched the bag, the more confident I became that it would find its way into the dumpster. And it did. This bag that I noticed off in the distance drifted 12 fucking stories and perfectly navigated its way into the dumpster below my building. Later that day, I was in the hotel lobby approaching the elevator to head up to my room. In front of me, there was a man with two children waiting for the elevator as well. The man had a guitar case strapped to his back, along with an amplifier and various other bags. His back was to me and he had a hoodie on. For some reason, I thought to myself, what if that's Ed? Ed was a friend of mine that I hadn't seen in years. We used to work at an olive garden together in our younger days. We also played guitar together and did a fair amount of partying. Now, here's the weird part, and my wife thinks I'm fucking crazy, but bear with me. The weird part was how confident I was that this guy was going to turn around and it would be Ed. The same confidence, almost certainty, I would say, that I had in that trash bag flying into the dumpster. The elevator door opened, and the man and his two children walked inside. As the man turned around to enter the floor number on the elevator button console. It should not have been Ed that I recognized, but it was. It was fucking Ed. We were both thrilled to see each other and even held the door open to chat for a moment, hindering other folks in the process. Even as this was all occurring, though, I couldn't shake this feeling that this isn't real. It's a very difficult thing to describe. But things just don't feel real. Later that evening, my 11-year-old son and I were on the balcony outside of our hotel room. 
He was peering over the edge when he suddenly whimpered out underneath his breath. That poor guy. When I asked him who and what he was talking about, he said, That bumblebee on the ground, next to the dumpster, he's dead. We were on the 12th floor, like I mentioned earlier. There's no fucking way this kid could see a dead bumblebee on the ground floor. Not to mention, the alleged bee was laying next to the dumpster that was the manifested landing zone for the floating trash bag. We argued a bit over whether or not he could see the bee when he finally convinced me to go down and take a look. As we made our way down to the street level, my thought process shifted. The same confidence that I had previously regarding the bag and Ed was back. Although I didn't mention it to my son, I was becoming increasingly certain that the bee would be there. And well, it was. It was fucking there, right next to the green dumpster containing the trash sack. The next evening, I took my family to a place called Gameworks, which is similar to a Dave & Buster's or an adult version of Chuck E. Cheese. I placed our car keys, wallets, and other important shit into our diaper bag backpack, and we carried it into the establishment. We spent a couple of hours playing games before finally counting our tickets and claiming prizes at the prize booth. We pocketed the prizes and went down the block to a cheesecake factory for dinner. After being seated for a few moments, my wife realizes that I don't have the backpack on. The backpack containing all of our money, credit cards, car keys, and not to mention food and supplies for our four-month-old. The bizarre thing is that I have no recollection of ever taking the bag off. Apparently I did because it was gone, but I could have sworn up and down that I never took it off. I immediately go into a panic mode, leap up from the table towards the Gameworks establishment. I run inside and dart around frantically for about a minute or two, with the bag nowhere in sight. Finally, I calm down and focus. After breathing and focusing for a moment, I'm greeted with that same confidence that I mentioned before. I was confident that I would not leave that place without that bag. And at that moment, a man approached me waving his arms in the air, calling me by my first name, saying, Here, Cody. I've got your bag, man. Now get back to the Cheesecake Factory and enjoy your dinner. I was awestruck and definitely beside myself at that moment as I had no fucking clue who this man was or how he knew my name or where I was eating dinner. I didn't even think to question the man. I reached out, grabbed the bag, and left. This might seem coincidental to a lot of you, but these are just recent examples of how my life unfolds daily. Either I'm a walking conduit of coincidence or something larger is at play. My wife thinks I'm nuts, but things are definitely not the same as they used to be. I don't know exactly how or why, but they just aren't. Things just don't seem real. When I was younger, I had a best friend named Sophia. She was a young girl about my age, and she wore a white dress with flip-flops. And we would play games, have play dates, all the time. We played princess and cook and all sorts of fun things, and we were best friends. Our friendship soon turned odd, when Sophia began acting strange. She appeared slightly different than normal, and she started to come in the middle of the night and wake me up, asking to play. She began to tell me things, when someone would get hurt or a strange occurrence would happen. Eventually, she would ask me to do things, and if I didn't do these things, bad things could happen. And eventually, she asked if it was okay if she could be me. 
I didn't understand what she meant, so I went to bed. Now at this point, I shared a bunk bed with my sister, and I would wait for her to fall asleep on the top bunk, and me and Sophia would sneak off and play. If my parents heard us, she would hide in her place and I would pretend to sleep. One night, she came to me, and I was really tired so I told her I didn't want to play, and she got very angry with me, and she told me bad things could happen if I didn't, and while sitting on the edge of the bed, she touched me for the first time, and her shockingly cold touch sent chills through my whole body, terrifying me. I screamed out for my parents waking my sister, and sending Sophia into the shadows just before my parents turned on the light. I told them what was going on, and they blamed my overactive imagination, claimed she was just imaginary, and that it wasn't real. The next few weeks, I closed the closet before bed, only to wake up to see her illuminated by a nightlight, standing with the closet door behind her, asking for me to come and play and whispering scary thoughts into my head. And every night, I refused to answer, calling to my parents to close the door when she'd opened it, and they accused me of opening the door for attention, and they began screaming at me to stop. My sister woke up a few times when the door opened, and she tried to defend me, but she only got in trouble for lying. For the next few days, my sister let me sleep on the top bunk with her, till her mom yelled at us and made us sleep apart, only for the cycle to continue. My mom got sick of me asking to close the door every night, and observed the pattern of when it happened, and waited to catch me in the act. She burst in one night when she heard the door opening, to find that I was tucked in bed. She watched as the door slowly creaked open, and she flicked on the light. She began to believe everything, apologizing for yelling and screaming at me, not believing, and forcing me to deal with it on my own. That's when she called in a psychic. The woman came in and read the room, asking me about my friend and telling me she wasn't actually friendly and that I needed to tell her to go away and that she wasn't welcome here anymore. The next night, I told her that I wasn't her friend and I never wanted to see her again, and she left. I was finally able to sleep peacefully until the night everything changed. I had been sleeping in my parents' room, and I woke up to the sound of the closet creeping open. And there she was, Sophia. She was staring at me from just inside the door, and slowly she crept forward until she was directly next to me. I was frozen with fear. She crept on top of me, holding me down, and I was stuck staring into her cold, lifeless eyes as fear encased me. Suddenly, I could feel my mom moving next to me, and it pulled me out. A blood-curdling scream erupted from within me, and my mother bolted up and was silenced with fear as she saw a tall, pitch-black shadow looming over me. She held on to me and tried to wake up my father, pounding her fist onto his chest and arms unable to let out a whisper. He finally woke up, shooting out of bed, threatening the demon, which flew over the bed and retreated out the window into the night. My mom and dad both swear that this thing was trying to get me and possess me. And honestly, I believe it the way it needed me to agree, and when I didn't, it got mad. 
and honestly, terrifying. We moved shortly after, and that specific entity is no longer around. Has anyone ever had an encounter on Haunted Route 44 in Rehoboth, Massachusetts? Recently, my girlfriend and I had a weekend that really had no significant plans, and we decided to make the hour or so trip to the road in question. Despite Route 44 having quite a reputation, we drove there expecting nothing, and that's mostly what we got. If you don't know the history behind the hauntings of that road, it is mostly about a man with red hair, a red beard, and red flannel shirt. Numerous people have died on the specific stretch of Route 44 in question, one of which fits the description of the red-headed hitchhiker. Common encounters are spotting him along the side of the road. Some even stop to pick him up which either results in the man vanishing or taunting the driver. Other common reports are that he sometimes just appears in your vehicle, as well as unexplained car troubles. We traveled the paranormal hotspot of Route 44 multiple times around 1 a.m. that night. We even tried shutting the vehicle off and turning it back on to see if we would experience any issues. For the most part, it was just a fun night and an excuse to get out of the house and back on the road for the first time since the fall. However, one strange event did occur that I cannot explain. At one point, the back seat got very cold, cold like a freezer. This cold was so intense I could feel it tingling the back of my neck. One might think it was just due to it being cold outside, but the dashboard isn't the only source of heat in my vehicle. Backseat passengers have their own heating vents, so the distribution of heat is very good. I have never liked modern vehicles, so I've never owned one. The vehicle I was driving that night was an old barn find, Jeep Cherokee, I restored years ago and have driven daily ever since. The reason I bring this up is because its engine is made of cast iron, while vehicles today are aluminum. I have heard that cast iron can temporarily eliminate or weaken an entity on contact. It has always made me wonder if maybe the reasoning behind my lack of experiences on haunted roads is due to the materials used to create my Cherokee. I've driven down many haunted roads over the years, And aside from locals acting like deranged lunatics, I haven't seen much. I have, however, seen and heard lots at haunted locations that did not involve a road. So this all has happened in the past, obviously. But it spans from around six to seven years ago to about a year ago at its most recent. I'll try to keep it as chronological as I can. Starting when I first actually remember seeing one, a shadow person. And for the first year or two of seeing shadow people, I would only see them, or it, outside, fairly far away. Like if I was playing outside with the neighbors I would see something tall, like taller than a normal person, shoot from one house to another. And any time I asked a neighbor, they would say nothing was there. And once I even ran over to see if it was a dog or something. I know that's a stupid explanation, but nothing was there. This continued for a while, until one point... I noticed them at night. I'd see it stand just out of view, under a lamppost, and I could tell it was there, like I got the feeling I was being watched. Shortly after, 
as I started seeing it more often. I was in my room, one night, being a kid, on an iPad, and I heard a noise from the side of my room. I had a flashlight, and shining it around the room I saw nothing. I was in a loft bed, so I was scared there was something beneath it. But there was nothing. I don't know why, but I shone the light towards the vent that was visible from my bed, and I definitely remember seeing an all-black face with glossy, beady eyes staring at me, then moving away from the light. I screamed. My mom came in, found nothing. About three years ago, one apparently was following me as I left in the dark early morning for the school bus. I didn't see this. My neighbor told me this. That as I left the garage and I left late, everyone else was already at the stop. I walked down the middle of the road and my neighbor yelled something to me. But I don't remember what it was. What I do remember is him and my sibling telling me that there was a tall, dark man right behind me. Checking the camera above the garage showed that nobody was present. Around two years ago, I abruptly stopped seeing it. This led me to believe that I was just seeing things and that it really didn't matter at all. But again, at night, I woke up to a feeling of something watching me. I rolled over and looked across my room, towards the door, and I saw a large, hulking figure hunched over like it didn't fit in the room I was too scared to move but it literally faded away in front of me and disappeared a month or so after that I woke up with the same sensation and I chose not to roll over to ignore it and I'm sure that it touched me I felt a sharp jab, as if someone poked you a little too hard on my upper back. I jumped so hard and didn't go to sleep the rest of the night. Finally, I was telling the neighbors about all of this, and they seriously told me that a girl who lived down the street had the exact same thing. Like... She told a similar story before she moved. It was really freaky. As of the last eight plus months, I haven't seen or heard from it since. Honestly, I'm kind of curious about it at this point. In February of 2012, I went to visit my grandfather's grave for his birthday. His death was a really hard thing for me to deal with, as he died in March of 2011, and it was still very fresh to me. I was kneeling in front of his grave, with my head down, mourning and crying, when my body went into full, danger-is-close-by mode. I looked up to see a man running full sprint from the woods surrounding the cemetery and forced myself to get in my truck as quickly as possible without the man getting too close to me. By the time I made it to my truck, he'd gotten about 50 feet from me. I jumped in and locked the door, much to his apparent displeasure. He threw his hands up in a huff like his favorite team had just lost a football game. I started the truck and started to drive out as fast as I could, but not before driving right past him. I didn't break eye contact for a second, and neither did he, so I got a really good look at his face. Cut to a few years later, I'm at work, bored, 
and decided to download an app that had a ton of paranormal, cryptid, serial killer, and UFO articles. As I was browsing through the serial killers, I came across one that made my heart drop into my ass. Israel Keys, most known for murdering an underage girl in Alaska, dismembering her body and dropping the pieces into a frozen lake. He would bury kill kits in places long before he ever committed the crimes. After the incident in Alaska, he had traveled into Texas for a wedding in a city not too far from where I lived and had disappeared for a bit and no one in his family knew where he was. He was arrested in that city and brought to the prison in one city over from me before he was extradited back to Alaska to stand trial. About a year ago, I found a book about him and it provided a lot of the details I've given here. He had been killing for years and no one knows what the actual death toll is. He actually killed himself in prison. At the end of the book about him, he described some of his favorite places to abduct people, public parks and cemeteries. I often wonder if there's a kit buried in those woods. You were fast, Israel, but I was faster, and I'm glad we didn't officially meet. Well, everyone... We've reached the end of the darkest hour, but I want to thank everyone so much for sharing their stories and everyone for listening. I upload new stories every Friday night, so if you like the darkest hour and you never want it to end, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Do you have stories like these? I'd love to share them. Send them to me, Amanda, darkest hour at gmail.com and check out our subreddit. The Darkest Hour YT. Stay spooky. <laughs>